Data, information, and knowledge are a few of the most important assets of our connected era. They're critical to human development. That's why we believe they must be safeguarded, open, and in the hands of the people. But they aren't in the current model, so let's start with that problem. Currently, the Web 2.0 model is centralization. Amazon, Google, Fastly, if any of these fail, and they do occasionally, entire services can go down. As you get decentralized and further and further distributed, your service's resilience increases as the users themselves are what are powering the service. On the right, in the distributed web, each user is also providing a piece of the network itself. If a user goes offline, the network functions as normal. If a major node goes down, the network can still function as well by leveraging the local peers. It is the champion of resilience, and the model I believe will take us forward. Breaking free from the centralized client-server model means rethinking how the web works as we know it today. So, what's the solution? How do we build a web that is distributed? Well, a key part of IPFS is that it's distributed. IPFS is not the answer to all the problems of the web, but it is the answer to some, particularly when it comes to removing borders and silos for data. Over the course of this workshop, we'll see that IPFS, a peer-to-peer -peer hypermedia protocol for content addressing, is an important building block in this new Web3 generation. Files and folders might sound boring, but really, they're not. So IPFS is the interplanetary file system. What is a file system? Files and folders. Any file with any content. Why interplanetary? Because it was conceived as a way to upgrade the web in a way that would still work when the network stretches across planets. The idea being that if you're sitting on Mars, it may take one hour for a request to go to and come back from Earth. But if that content was already fetched by someone else on Mars, then the request should not travel all the way back to Earth for it. And that feature should be provided transparently by the network protocol rather than by something on top. As we will see, IPFS is distributed by design. No central authoritative servers are storing content and no central server needs to be contacted in order to obtain the content. Typically, you would upload the content to a server, a location. Anyone wanting to download that content will have to get it from that same location. With IPFS, things are slightly different. In IPFS, you run an application called the IPFS peer and with it, you become a server, also known as a node, in the network. You don't upload content anywhere, but instead add it to your own node and make it discoverable by everyone else. Any content that is published on IPFS uses content addressing, which is a way of referencing a piece of data by its hash. To do this, we'll need to know how to obtain a content identifier. IPFS addresses content by what it is instead of where it is. It enables you to refer to a file or folder via a content ID, regardless of its location. Let's think of the process we follow when we save data. Locally, it just goes on our drive and is addressed there by its path. The web itself is no different. When we open a website, we are just opening some files. The difference is just that they need to be downloaded from a remote location, and we do that using a browser, which will print pretty things on our screens. With IPFS, we're also obtaining files from a remote location. However, the key difference here is that we don't need to know the location of the content, but instead what is called a content identifier. Ultimately, the content can be at one or several locations, but as we will see, it does not matter anymore where it is. We switch from a location-based identifier to content addressing by using a CID. Next, let's look at the key technologies making this possible. In order to be able to have content addressing, we need to create content identifiers for each piece of information that we want to put on the network. Think of this as a kind of cryptographic fingerprint of that piece of content. Every piece of content produces a different fingerprint. All the fingerprints are of the same size, regardless of the amount of content that they represent. This fingerprint, which we named content ID, can be reproduced any time from the original content by hashing it. This means that if we obtain a piece of content after requesting a content ID, we can verify that we were given exactly what we asked for. But what about folders? Folders are really just special types of files, which have lists of files in that folder as the content. 
That provides the names of those files and, in the case of IPFS, their CIDs. Since a folder is a type of file, a CID can be obtained in exactly the same way as for any other type of file. This means that we can represent a folder or even a full file system using a content address structure. Let's bring it to life. As you see here on the left side, our top level folder has a root content ID, has two entries corresponding to two folders, and those folders have other entries corresponding to files. Each entry has a different fingerprint. That's visualized with the colors here. This content addressed type of graph is what we call Merkle DAGs, also known as directed acyclic graph. These Merkle DAGs used by IPFS allow us to move from location-based addressing to content addressing in a single step. We're just replacing locations with the root CID of their content. The subpaths stay the same. One characteristic of content addressing that I mentioned is that the fingerprints are unique for any type of content. So what would happen if we wanted to copy file.txt to the folder of the second user? It means two things. Firstly, we don't have to actually copy the file. We just have to modify the folder to reference the content. Two copies of the same content have the same identifier, so to IPFS, they are the same thing. There is no notion that the same content can be duplicated in different folders in IPFS because it's actually the same thing with the same CID. We call this property deduplication. Secondly, since we changed a folder, the fingerprint of that folder changed. So we had to update the upper folder too to reference the new fingerprint. This means that the fingerprint from that folder changed resulting in a new root CID. The moment something changes, you get a completely different CID. Your previous CID still references your previous version of the content, which has not been changed. The fact that a CID will always represent exactly the same piece of content, unlike a location, unlocks the capacity of doing verification on any piece of data. This matters because if the CID is guaranteed to give you the same content, you don't have to get that content from a trusted centralized server. You can ask anyone in the network for that CID, regardless of whether you trust them. So the first step when adding content to the IPFS network is to obtain the content identifiers for that content. This can happen offline at any moment. Once we have those CIDs, the next step is to in announce them to the IPFS network so that they can be retrieved by other IPFS peers. But what is a peer? And what does it do? So peers in peer-to-peer -peer systems are nodes that are connected to other peers to form a network or swarm. Forget for a moment about IPFS and think about a group of people. If I want to address a person and communicate, it helps if I can identify them, for example, by their name. If we share a common language so we can communicate, and if we have ways to verify that we are who we claim to be. Same with IPFS and the peers in the network. Each peer has a unique identifier, their peer ID. This identifier is linked to a cryptographic identity, which allows each peer to communicate securely through an encrypted channel. The peers in the IPFS network are peers which support a set of services or protocols. One of them serves to request certain content by its CID from a different peer and download it. But in order to get there, it means that peers need to be able to discover each other. The network transports they support, be that TCP, Bluetooth, UDP, and the services they can understand. This step is called content and peer routing and is achieved using something called a distributed hash table, also known as a DHT. The DHT or the distributed hash table is a critical service that each peer runs. You can think of a distributed hash table like a phone book, except that everybody helps maintain it. It's effectively a series of keys paired to values, kind of like names paired to phone numbers. In order to get the value associated to a key, for example, a content ID, a peer will need to find some other peer that is storing it. The process consists of asking other peers in the network, who has the value for this key? But not in a random fashion. Remember that not every peer is connected to every other peer. 
peers with certain names, or peer IDs, are more likely to store certain key value pairs. Thus, a peer knows which of the peers it is connected to is most likely to have the value for the key that it's looking for. And if it doesn't have it, it will request information about peers known by the other peer, which are more likely to have it. So now that we have a database, which is maintained collectively by all the peers in the system, how does IPFS use it? Simple. When the content is added to IPFS, a peer will insert one row into the DHT. Keys are either content IDs or peer IDs. Peers can add rows to the DHT, declaring A, their peer ID provides specific CIDs, and B, how to connect with their peer ID. Peers can then query the DHT to find which peer ID is providing which content IDs. Peers can also query the DHT to find information on how to connect to that peer ID. Publishing this row involves finding a peer ID similar enough to the content ID to store the row. In short, any peer that wants to download some content will have to do two things. First, query the DHT to find which peer ID is providing the content they're looking for. Second, query the DHT again to find information on how to connect to that peer ID. At the end of the DHT queries, a peer knows who has the content it wants and where to get it. So now that we've gone over obtaining a CID, advertising it on the network, and locating content, let's take a brief look at transferring content. The last step to retrieve content in the IPFS is to download it. Because we know how to contact the peer holding the content, and we know what content we want, we can connect, receive, and verify it. This means that any content received through IPFS is authentic and matches the request. Once content is downloaded, the local peer will advertise itself as a provider for that content on the DHT, making it available to other peers for download. The protocol we use to download files is called BitSwap, and also works for quick discovery by asking all other neighbors whether they have the content, for example, if they can't find it in the DHT. While BitSwap is incredible for fast distributed transfers, it's generally only used from an IPFS node. Sometimes you want to share something that's only available over the IPFS network to your friend who might not be using IPFS. Or another scenario might be that you're simply unable to run an IPFS node in the environment you're working in. This is where gateways come into play. Gateways are accessed over HTTP and can be used in any web browser as a result. Effectively, a gateway is just an IPFS node that's set up to serve requested data over HTTP. They're basically a portal into the IPFS world and are more decentralized instead of distributed. For example, if you created an app that just accessed IPFS content over a single gateway and that gateway goes down, then your app is broken until the gateway comes back. Additionally, if you used a malicious gateway, you might not even know that you're receiving the correct data. Though, there is a solution that was recently released to resolve verifiability via CAR files, which are content addressed archives, but that's for a deeper talk. Gateways are very convenient, but less resilient. It's up to you to decide what works best for you. Well, this is near the end, so come join our ecosystem to learn and build. We have an awesome community comprised of builders who help us foster a positive and productive environment. I highly encourage you to check out a resource we compiled of several tutorials currently available at tinyurl.com slash learn dash IPFS dash Filecoin as well. Well, that's it for me. I will now be leaving you all in Lindsay and Ali's capable hands. I hope that you have a wonderful time at IPFS camp. It looks like a lot of fun.